Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. While the salmon season has officially begun, we're still in the thick of it, so to speak, with the long nights still hanging over us and many of you are getting busy at the vice in anticipation of your own local waters opening in the coming weeks. So for this week's episode, we catch up with former international angler and renowned fly tire Ryan Houston to find out about his fly fishing career, his fly tying obsession, and also to get some fly tying secrets from one of the best on the island. And Tom, before we hear from Ryan, I thought it was interesting to hear just how much Ryan's fly tying has also enabled him to become a better angler. Yeah, Dara, wasn't it? It was, it was really good to, to listen to him and, and to say, like, you know, he talks of initially how he started fishing and then how he, he went to fly tying, you know, how he got into it at such a level to improve his fishing. And, and it did, you know, when he talks of, you know, having having patterns that nobody else had. Um, particularly at a time, and I, I can really relate to it because we're, as I said, we're about the same vintage and what was available then wasn't great compared to what you can get now for shop bought flies and how, but how he used his fly tying ability to further his angling career. It was great. I, th- I thought it was interesting as well, because I asked him about, uh, you know, sharing them with the club members. No, 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 no. <laughs> Well, that's how you win the competitions. I mean, that's it. I mean, like you know, I mean, we've we've a classic one here. Uh, when you're asked about something, it's there was something I tied up myself. Sure, it didn't really matter. They'd have taken anything. <laughs> Once you hear that, you know. The only thing is, at least you're not being lied to. Yeah, yeah, you're being. Politely told to f off, like yeah, politely, yeah. In, in the it's a bit like asking, way. it's like asking somebody where for a mark, like you know, <laughs> GPS coordinates. Yeah, no, no, it is. And look, I mean, there's that element. I mean, in competition fishing, as you know, I do a fair bit of it myself. And if if you have something working coming up to an event, if it's going to give you, if it's going to give you, sort of an advantage, well, naturally you're going to. You're going to sort of say, well, that's my advantage. I, you know, I worked on that, particularly if it's something you've tied yourself. So, you know, I'll use it. But then further down the line, oh, nothing remains a secret for too long in fishing. True. You know, and that's true as well. So things do get out. And, you know, as we've said it before here, a lot of what non-competitive anglers use as methods, and particularly as flies now, you know, were born out of the competition scene. Exactly, about trying to get that edge trying to get that advantage um and it was interesting that when you know as you'll hear when ryan explains you know his fly fishing career when he was younger and then the fly tying obsession that he kind of got into how it really did push on his fly fishing career in terms of winning competitions and now he's kind of at the stage like he says with the kids family it's now more more fly tying less fly fishing yeah. and it's actually for him about the challenge of the fly tying now it was very interesting when he you know, when he said like when he pick up the magazines you know, he would look at flies to tie them. And I, as I say to him when we're talking to him, I would look at fly. I still look at flies as something, oh, I could catch fish with this. But he's actually yeah. made that that jump and he just wants to tie that fly, which just shows you the, the, the level which he has got to in his fly tying, you know. Can I ask you then, right? And I think I asked it, Ryan is, so, because I don't tie flies, but it was interesting when he was talking about the edge it gave him. And as you were saying there, does being a fly tire make you a better fly angler. I'm not saying, obviously we're not saying the best fly tires are the best fly anglers, but what I'm saying is being halfway decent at fly, at tying your own flies, does that make you the, a better angler? Right. And I think I say it, I, and the best way of putting it, it doesn't necessarily make you a better angler, but it definitely helps you. It definitely helps you. You know, there are some guys that are, and I know a couple of lads on the competition scene that don't tie their own flies and they are fantastic anglers, you know, and they'll do anything in their power to get all patterns and everything. And they have to work at it like that. Um, and on the other side, I know some really good fly tires who, uh, how would I put this? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're decent anglers, but for some of them, you know, it's not really the, the fly tying can go it's to a level where it's not actually the angling at this stage. It's just yeah. to, to fish their own flies that are really well tied. But like for me, I said, I would say that definitely being a, a half decent fly tire, no doubt helped me in my, in my fishing. Yeah. And, and in fairness, I kind of, 
when we were speaking to Ryan and he's some very good tips as well in terms of, you know, if you're looking to start out or looking to improve your fly tying, you know, just in terms of kind of how to approach it and, you know, the importance of maybe just <clears throat> tying a fly that you're going to use, you know, that you want to use out in the water. And then when you start catching with it, then, you know, the, the bug gets under you and, and you start wanting to do more. So I think, I think there's a lot for people to get out of this. It's an interesting interview, um, you know, between the fly fishing and the fly tying side of things. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if many people will get as obsessed as Ryan. In but terms here, of- tell me, I'll ask you now, Dara. Tell me, like, after chatting to him, and you say you don't tie flies. I know you, you have had a go at it a while back. After chatting to him, and he gives a couple of nice tips and everything, any chance is going to go into the small bucket list? It's getting to the stage now where I have to literally start just saying no to things. You know that kind of way? Um <laughs> I, I got, you know, a jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. Um, like it, it didn't, I think it might, when I first started fly fishing, when I really got into it and, you know, was like blown away by all the different aspects of the sport. I think that was the time probably maybe when, if it was going to get under my skin and if it was going to hook me in, um, I would do it. I just, yeah, I kind of look at it and go, God, do I want to sit down there learning a new skill and having to put, oh God, this sounds terrible. I'm not exactly selling it, um, but putting the time into it. There is something appealing to it, I think, on a winter's, winter nights or long nights where, you know, what are you doing in the evening? You want to be sitting there. Do you know what? Take out the vice and start tying some flies. I kind of just do another stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's just the reality. So I kind of, yeah, whether it's training, reading writing whatever like and i've kind of made that conscious decision it's like yeah. actually it's funny it's like when i made i talk about kind of when i moved to tipperary um 15 years ago and the shore is nearby me and the golf course is nearby me and i did fish when i was younger and i did a bit of golf when i was younger right and i knew Didn't know that now. I, ah sure yeah, <laughs> <Keep no>. that. <laughs> my, pr- my pringle jumper collection is <laughs> hidden in the wardrobe <laughs> but I did make the conscious, I did at the time think, oh, right, I could do, I could do one or the other. I can't do both. I knew it because I knew if I was going to play golf, that was it. You'd be doing it. Yeah. And I knew if I was going to be doing fishing, that would be it. I wouldn't have room for both. And that's why I just made a conscious decision. No. And I, like, I still drive by the golf course every day, like, you know, heading in, into care. Like, so it's, and yeah, half of me hankers going, God, I'd love to be out you know, hitting a few balls down there and it looks brilliant. And then you kind of go, do you know what? There's only so many things you can do in this lifetime. So, you know, just focus on it. So, yeah, I don't know. I think the fly tying <laughs> boat has left me for this stage is my long winded way of saying, don't think so. No. <laughs> I could have yeah. just said no. Yeah, what you like to <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, let's hear from Ryan Houston now and an actual fly tire. Um, and I first asked him about how he got into fly tying in the first place. I started fairly young. I was probably in primary six whenever I started and uh, just started fly fishing. My dad took me uh, one week on the River Lagan uh, at Marlin. And the next week, my uncle came around and gave me one lesson in fly tying. Basically, how you put a hook in a vise, how you attach the thread, how you basically tie in materials. And then that was it. From then, it was just something. I think with fly tying, you either get it or you don't. And it sort of clicked with me and I sort of spent all my time up. My dad actually converted the roof space. So I'd be going up there and uh, basically spending every minute that I got sort of working out how to how to tie flies myself. I had a, an old John Venyard book, which I sort of mulled over as well, and it actually fell to pieces. Uh, the whole backing and all came off it, but just I would I would sort of get myself into that. And, and from there, I sort of just, I taught myself, I suppose, essentially. Was it initially trout flies? Were you fishing it, for trout? Or? Yeah, it was all trout, uh, brown trout on the river lagging. Right. So. so were you, as a kid and teenager growing up, That's that was your thing? You'd love to, obviously you'd love to be fishing, but when you couldn't be fishing, you'd just disappear up there and just be... Oh, well, I suppose, uh, yeah, well, winter time was for tying flies, you know, for the rest of the season. But during the season then, it was tying flies because you were going fishing the next day or because you were going fishing that weekend. So it was kind of, I suppose, initially out of necessity. Uh, and it was, I suppose, when I started, like it was the 80s. So we were probably still basic dry flies and down and across wet flies. Uh, but I think what drove me was uh, we had, in the club that I was in, we had quite an active competition scene. And as I come up through the junior ranks from that there, 
I would be going out fishing and then trying to go back to the vice and work out what would have you know worked better for me. And I think what happened was water quality around about then I think started to go downhill and the fish maybe weren't so much up because a lot of it, our fishing then was predominantly dry fly. And then I worked out how to nymph and nymph under indicators and stuff like that. So whenever I was, that would have probably been whenever I was maybe from 15, 16, 17. And then whenever I joined the, the senior ranks, then that propelled me to win in the competitions because I was catching the bigger fish that had sort of gone down to the bottom to feed off the hog louse and stuff like that. And I was tying weighted nymphs and things, which weren't so common uh, among the rest of us fishing at the time. That's the advantage of actually, and I've always said it, being able to tie your own flies. Yeah. Because yeah. particularly at that time, a lot of those patterns weren't readily available, were they, Ryan? No. No, no like every, everything was winged wets, like you went in, you'd bought iron yeah. blue wet flies and stuff like that there. Um, but as I said, you go out, you could try something that didn't work, you found a new material, you know, like the, the, the range of materials that there is now is exponential compared to what we were dealing with. Like I remember you know, getting my first tip at collar, et cetera, and thinking it was the best thing on earth, you know, and, uh, and there was old fly shops going in and smelling the naphthalene and you were coming away. But like, but the range of stuff was was minute compared to what it is now. But if you found something new or you shot something or somebody gave you something, you could always incorporate it and try and get a little bit of movement or like a lot of commercial flies are better now than what they were then. But like a lot of them then were brutal and they were so heavily dressed, you know, that, they were next to useless. There just were more fish about, probably. But being able to put less turns on something, a bit more movement in it, add little hot spots or a bit of ribbon or a little bit of weight or something, I think that helped with my success in the competition, fishing the local competitions that we were fishing then. So that was that drove my my tie in, I think. Uh, and then whenever I first came of age. I suppose I uh, and came into the senior ranks. Then I won uh, our annual league th that year, and that allowed me then to qualify to fish the Ulster qualifiers, etc. And I went on in that next year to uh, qualify for Ulster. Then I won the national rivers championship, and that got me to fish the home internationals for Ireland. So that, but that I think was on the back of my flight time. I was just going to say that 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 wouldn't have happened. Well, it would have been a lot harder for you to have done it if you weren't tying your own flies. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So then, when when we went to the to the competition, you know, like I would be, I brought my stuff with me, and people would, you know, the guys would come in after the day's practice and say, "Can you copy this or so on?" And <laughs> because I could, I could. So, did you find that as well? Like even from a younger age, Ryan, fellas in the club were asking for you to tie flies for them. No. Okay. <laughs> no, I suppose wow. that I did I didn't really offer it, I suppose, because like you know, you're trying to keep Good you're man. trying to keep it secret. This is working, I'm not going to give it to everybody. Hence you know, why like, you won the championships. <laughs> yeah. So uh so yeah, down the line, you know, it would filter through a little bit. But no, I think people were they were quite uh how would you say it? They weren't overly open, you know, like if they were all catching on something, they would lie to you. You know, what what are you catching it on? And they'd say a wee beauty. <laughs> would be the answer to it like so so you kind of learn yourself then to not give too much away so uh i guess I the of, competition scene yeah well i've seen guys have arguments over you know the number of turns of rib that there need to be on things and it, it's it's ridiculous <laughs> you know i say the one thing like as i said not being a fly tire but tom speaking to you and and ryan even hearing you there speak is you, you become a better fly angler, don't you, when you're tying? Because it's forcing you to think about yeah. how to solve problems and how to, you know, catch those fish that you were missing before. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're much more, it makes you think a lot more, I think. Yeah, well, you're, you're, you have to probably to think much more about what those fish are eating and how that's behaving and how what your tying relates to that. Mm -hmm. You know, as I said, some Commercial flies tend to be very bulky and therefore less life, and maybe they don't sink at the same rate or move the same way. Maybe they're too big. So you can, whenever you're tying yourself, you can tie whatever size you want. You can tie it short, you can tie it heavy, you can you can add weight, you can make it float, you can do whatever you want with it. So it just uh, it's more versatile, I think. Yeah, you'd be the same time, wouldn't you? Like from your own perspective with the the lakes fishing, like 
Oh, completely, completely. Although I have to say, and you probably agree with me there, right? Like, because we're more or less the same vintage. Uh, if we compare, if we compare the commercial flies that were available in the eighties to what's available now, they've improved yeah. vastly. Now. They yeah. really have. I mean, there's yeah. nothing compared. Like I remember, you used to get lake flies, and like you'd have been talking about the river flies. There, we used to get lake flies, and they were. The, they were atrocious, some of them. <laughs> and, and 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 to boost, they had really bad hooks. So, so yeah, well that that is the that is the biggest thing I think that even now, the commercial flies they can still be on dubious hooks. But I think the the quality of what's coming out the dressings has definitely vastly vastly improved. But the, but you can still get them on dubious bits of lead wire. So yes, yeah, yeah. But I get the sense of you, Ryan, is that you were get you got that balance right. Like the fly, tying of flies was a means to an end, as in winning competitions. You yeah. Know. Well, early when when I had the time to fish, I suppose <laughs> is my point. Like when when I was younger, like I'd have been on the river, oh, maybe four or five days out of seven. You would have been there certainly during the summer. I'd have been there most nights. It was within distance that I could have went down on the bike or I'd have got a lift down to it. Um, and certainly, I think whenever you're practicing. Or trying to fish for you know internationals, etc., like that. There, the practice really does make a difference. You know that you have to you have to be there. It's the same as course anglers. You know, like they're going out and if if they're practicing all the time, it's an extra one or two fish. But at the end of the day, that makes a difference to them. And I think with with uh, certainly the catch and release type competitions, with the numbers that you have to catch, that that practice needs to be there and. For me, the time was available when I was younger, but then whenever I got my A levels, etc., and moved on, the time sort of moved away. So I qualified twice to fish for Ireland, and then after that, just whenever I went to university, I didn't have the time. So probably I moved more towards uh, fly tying, and I probably moved a lot away from the trout end of things, and I moved towards concentrating what time I had on fishing for salmon. So it was a total change. I, I did it and I quit. <laughs> so and what, what, what was the thinking or the reason for moving to the sun? Was it location? Uh, well, well, I suppose well, I, I went to college in Dublin. I did take a rod with me and I fished the daughter a bit when I was down there. Um, but then I I didn't ever buy a ticket. I didn't realize that it was a club. <laughs> it's uh, a long enough for you. Right. They're looking, no, they're looking for you. So, uh, but I suppose when I was coming back, you know, I was only got the weekends whenever I was coming back. So, uh, and, and I was working as well, you know, make money to pay for beer. And essentially when it rained, I went fishing for salmon and throughout, uh, I, I large, I, I sort of moved away from it a bit, I suppose. I suppose the, the competition fishing was, was a draw in itself. You know, it's, it's like a, how would you put it? It's like a fix. But when it's not there, maybe it just didn't drive me as much. And maybe, you know, the salmon, there were like, you know, and salmon do strange things to, to people, you know, the way they behave. Right? And so I think uh, you start off your when you're fishing for them and it's it's, it's almost like a drug. So I, I caught the salmon bug and I moved to them largely. And then when it was dry, I went out still fishing for trout, but uh, largely salmon then from them. And then, come here. How did you find then the crossover to starting to tie salmon flies? Did, was it nice and easy for you, or how were your first attempts? Well, the first attempt at a salmon fly, I suppose, I'd have been again looking at like the vineyards guys and stuff like that, and, and you were sort of looking at these classic flies, and I hadn't read too much about fishing for them, etc., and what flies you should use. So I was kind of thinking those were the things that I should be tying, and I didn't have all the materials for them. So I was making these sort of abominations of things. Uh, and then we actually went. Well, the first salmon I got, I think I was like probably thirteen or so. Uh, I got that on the cathedral stretch on a spinner. But then we went to Eski, uh, Portland, and at the time you could fish it relatively cheaply. And we went there for a for a school trip. And uh, somebody said a band special is the fly to fish. So somebody described to me what a band special was, but really badly. <laughs> so I, 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 I can copy what someone tells me, or I can copy a fly. That that's something I can do. But if someone gives you the wrong recipe, so I turned up with these band specials, <laughs> which are no more like a band special, but 
they caught salmon like I, I caught a fish and you know like half an hour after starting I actually think we got three or something that day uh, but it was on a fly that's no more like a band special but it is a fly that subsequently ended up with a place in the box because it was the first and, and I did catch more salmon after it I was just going to ask you do you still have the Houston band special? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, don't think, I don't even think it has a name at this stage but like it it had a fluorescent orange rear body made out of floss so instead of being you know, your black and your yellow seals fur and the hackles were the hackles were grizzle instead of being badger like so it was a completely different fly but it caught it caught salmon of course so, yeah so i yeah mo- moving over to that i think was it's straightforward <laughs> enough what was it dressed on did you dress it on a, a single Treble. double or travel no yeah. asmund jury travels uh fitly tea bag makers out of your fingers yeah so. how did you find that that's one thing like because i'm primarily a trout always have been trout fly tire and yeah. anytime i've tried to I, I just, I can't hack tying on a treble hook. I, I, just, I just rip the top off my fingers. Well, you, instead, a lot of people struggle because you're plinking the, the mm. uh, thread on the hook points the whole time. So instead of wrapping straight like that, you have to do, you have to work out this strange, it's not even a figure of eight because there's three hooks. So it's, it's like a, it's like a weird triple of eight uh, thing so it's, it's getting but then that depends on whether you want to get it back but everybody's style is different like I probably tie quite full on the shanks like some people tie salmon flies you may have seen quite short and they would actually start mm-hmm. the body a hell of a lot further up but so you tie your fly smaller on a given size hook so you may be using a size 10 hook but tie on a size 12 fly which you can do with trout flies etc anyway then you get the extra gape and you get the extra weight of your hook and therefore your fly react slightly different in the water actually yeah but that's probably a good tip for anybody who's starting off on the trebles first just to, 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 to use forward. yeah to use that let's say um use a size 10 hook for your size 12s and just yeah. so you get used to it and then unlike me because i i packed it in after that my fingers said to me no just well stop. isn't it it's, it's not too bad on once you get to like size 10s and above you're all right 14s are just like even now like I, i'll bleed most nights sometimes <laughs> like, you know because because without thinking about it you turn around or you're using a you know a needle or something like that and you'll stab yourself or stab yourself with the hook easy enough, so so when you search the salmon is as salmon um fishing and um salmon fly time that's been your your bag ever since then ryan has it like i i sort of how would how would you put it i like to be able to tie everything so i uh, if i seen you know, magazines, they're not what they used to be now. They've taken a massive downturn lately, I suppose. They're disappearing. But like those glossy trout and salmons and trout fishermans and stuff like that there, you know, I, I always love getting them. I'd look at a fly in it and go, I want to be able to tie that. And it doesn't matter what it is. I would, I would go look at the picture, work out how to do it, buy the materials to do it. So I, I kind of flit from one thing to another, but I, I, I like to be able to tie absolutely everything so i'm more probably driven by fly tying now than fishing um so especially since the kids come along you know you get less and less time to actually go fishing but you can go up there at night and you can tie whatever you whatever you want so if i see something new i want to be able to tie it and unfortunately that costs a fortune and materials like as uh Everybody thinks you should get into fly time to make your flies cheaper. If you think that you're, you're mental, <laughs> you know, uh, the only way that possibly works is if you actually fish with maybe two patterns and just buy the materials to tie those and tie nothing but them. But if you go anything beyond that, then it's just a, it's a weird collecting fetish. Yeah. <laughs> but if we, <laughs> uh, shows their fly time bug that you have that when you look at a fly, like whereas when I used to pick up the magazines, I would look at I would look at a fly and I go, I'll tie that because I want to catch it. Mm-hmm. When you look at a fly, you go, I'll tie that because I, I want to tie, to tie it. it. Yeah. 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 So are you doing it then for nowadays in terms of the fly tying? It's the challenge for you now, Ryan. Is it to see what you can do? Yeah, to an extent. Like I suppose I, I, once around about the time that I did the competition fishing. I I did enter a couple of uh, meal, not meal order meal, uh, meal in fly competitions, and I wanted to do that because I knew I was all right, but I wanted to see how all right I was. So I started entering fly competitions, and I started winning them. And that again was like a new bug to me, you know, to to push you on. And a lot of those 
some of them will give you a set pattern, which I find interesting as well, in that you have to produce something as you know, you might have to tie three of them exactly the same. So that's a challenge in itself, but then they may give you an invention challenge. So you might have to tie three the same and then tie like a tiebreaker fly yourself, which is basically all out, do whatever you can, all singing, all dancing. And that it's that invention and that push that that drove me again for for a while. But again, magazines have disappeared, competitions and stuff have kind of largely disappeared as well. So you have to find something else to motivate yourself to tie. So uh, I remember those competitions. It was was a fly fishing and fly tying. Yeah, you fly fishing and fly fishing and fly tying. I'm sorry. I remember you won one of those, didn't you? I won the first one of those that I entered. Yeah, I remember. I remember you winning this. Yeah, I remember that. And yeah. then uh, there was the Irish Open. Then I think there was two years of it. And then there was Mostad Scandinavian Open that used to run. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't. Does it run again? Or, or, I. Yeah. Don't know. I, yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. It was quite good. It had like ten categories, and you could just enter uh, one or enter all ten or whatever you wanted. And they sent mm-hmm. you a medal if you came for second or third, and they sent yeah. you a certificate if you come in the top ten, and uh, a packet of hooks and and whatnot. And they all sort of died to death, which I think was a real sort of shame because it it was a motivation, you know, and it got people doing stuff during the winter time. And I wish it was still there yeah yeah it's pity you do shows as well don't you um ryan obviously <laughs> yeah pandemic there. Yeah. Um, yeah hopefully everything's coming back on stream now again um is the beauty of the shows i'm fascinated when i go to them say um it was the galway one you'd go to and you'd yeah you know you walk by the rows of you know just to see the hugely talented um skills on show and I love seeing the different styles like I said you, yeah. you know all the different um tires and the different styles for you for those shows is one is it a case of meeting other fly tires from you know around Europe around the world yeah um and then also do you find that that's a great in terms of kind of exchanging of ideas or what 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 do you get out of those shows well like like, like you say you know you they're having people there from all over the world and so I would sort of take a walk around, see what I like. If I see somebody with something that I've never seen before, you can sit down, you can watch them, you can chat to them, uh, learn something new, take it back to yourself. A lot of them will sort of swap a fly with you, you know, so you get to have something in your hand that you can then copy from. Um, so, yeah, there's that. There's sort of camaraderie. There's the after show uh, frivolity shall we say but also you get to meet people and you get links and you know you might get fishing out of it or you might get somebody sent you know material that you can't get yourself uh the other thing about the shows that i like is materials um i like i say i collect (laughs) i have have more stuff than i could tie with in 20 lifetimes up there Uh, and but materials it's one thing buying something online but to actually get it in your hand and you can appreciate the quality of it, especially with capes, you know, that you can see the color of it, you can see how it's going to react, you can see the size of it, the stiffness of the of the stems, etc. I really like that. And uh, and the other thing I like is that people are coming to you. Well, some of them want to buy flies off you, some of them want to learn how to tie stuff, and other ones will go away and they'll come back with a cape from downstairs and they'll bring it up to you and say, you know, what do you think of this one? Is it a good one? You know, should I buy this one? And it's good that the world works in that way in the fly world, you know, that they, that they can do that rather than buying a load of rubbish essentially and constricting their, their ability to tie. So, And just on that, then I suppose the flip side of it is um, take YouTube, for example, mm-hmm. you know, um, the rise of the, you know, the YouTube channels, it must be brilliant for fly tying in the sense of you can showcase your skills. You can look at other fly tires, what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And and likewise, kind of communicate that way. You've got your own YouTube channel. Tell us a bit about it and when you started. And, you know, is it something that you're looking to build on all the time? Uh, it, yeah, it's fine, finding the time, I suppose, to do it. Uh, I uh, When I get into things, I tend to sort of binge on stuff, as my partner tells me. I'm in a fad. So uh, what I'll do is, like, I might put up, you know, 10 videos in, in a week or something like that there. Uh, and then you might not see anything from me for about three months. So that that's something that I kind of have to work on is sort of like consistency of getting getting product up or you know, content up 
uh, on a regular enough basis so that it, it keeps people interested. Um, I started it, oh, well, it's not that long ago. It's maybe like four years or five, four years or something ago. Um, so part of it was, you know, some people want to buy flies, some people want to tie flies. So it, it, it's there in perpetuity for them, you know, that they, they don't have to come asking the question all the time because it's not always possible to find the time to, uh, to, to answer their question to them. So like I said, but if you have it there as a video, at least anybody can go in their own time, take what they want from it and, and off they go. Um, my thinking behind mine is that it's largely no frills. I, I, I probably tie a little bit faster than I tie on the videos, but I do tie very fast in general anyway. Um, so I have to slow it, I have to slow myself down a little bit for them. But I also wanted it. A lot of videos that I've seen, you know, take far, far too long, in my opinion. And you know, I if I'm watching them, I will literally fast forward to the bit that I like to see, and then they can explain it at length. Um, but my videos I do in one take because I'm not that. As, as you know from our discussions on trying to get this organized, all the time. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a tech wizard. So I, I try to make them that it's kind of one take and then I just have to add it on a, a starting sequence and an end sequence. But it's something also that it's, if I can make that consistent, it's something that people choose whether they like or not, and then they will choose whether to follow you. Um, so I, I try to just be fairly no frills attached. Some of the videos I do, or maybe if I take one element and maybe go a little bit more into detail on that, but in general, most of my videos would uh, be as, as short as I could make it to get someone through the entire time. If they want to take it, then they can slow down and watch other bits again if they feel like it. So. What about um, for people starting out? Any tips for for beginners or people just looking to kind of get into it? Like, is it focus on one fly at the start, you know, one style? Uh, well, th that's something I've been sort of thinking about lately because some of the questions that I get asked, you'd be surprised at how basic the question actually is. And almost all of our YouTube videos, etc., cetera, uh, presume that you have a basic set of skills, you know, and, and there's a fly here, tie this fly, uh, and then maybe I give you the list of stuff that's in it. But I get people, even at shows, you know, people come up and, and they want to know how to actually attach the thread to the hook in the first place. They want to know how to, uh, you know, finish the fly off, how to actually dub stuff, you know, dub, put dubbing on, on a thread. So I've kind of been thinking that at some point I'm going to try and do a really, really basic uh, set of individual broke down videos on something like that, because that is something I think that, that people are actually wanting. Um, but the problem there is that you have a, an audience that are used to you doing one thing. And if you do anything, you know, if I tie a trout fly, people will like it, but the people that like salmon flies maybe put a dislike on it or, or pike flies or something like that there because I tie all manner of different stuff. So you can't really please everybody, but it is something that I'm going to do in future because my advice to people would be that they should pick a fly they're going to tie with or they're going to actually fish with, something that's going to be of use to them. And just get the stuff to do that because people are going, what kit should I buy? And I say, don't buy a kit because most kits are full of superfluous rubbish that, you know, it, a lot of it is maybe going to be stuff that they couldn't shift. So they've stuck in weird blues and weird pinks and, you know, stuff that's unlikely, you know, whenever you've seen a fly shop back in the day. Black, you know, black chenille. Yeah. Yeah. Five meters of black chenille. There you are. <laughs> yeah, well, like the, what? What are you going to do with that? Like the the ace of spades and the black chenille <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, they they caught well. Well, they're they're like how would you put it? Classic rainbow lures now. You know, yeah. like they they went out of fashion a long time ago. It's not to say you can't tie them for your own interest, but mm. you do end up and fly shops used to end up they'd buy all every color of marabou that a that a supplier produced, and then they'd end up with you know five packets of baby blue and stuff like those are the sort of things that I I find you find in a fly tying kit and a lot of stuff that you're never going to use, you know, it's, it's random. So I think just start with something simple, here's your nymph, simple wet fly, simple dry fly, something that you're going to use and just get the materials for that. And when you're tie it over and over and over again, until you're happy with it. And every time you tie it, make it a bit better than the last time. People tend to rush through fly time, especially with classic flies, you know, the wing is the star. 
So they rush to get the pudding mat on and the rest of it looks like a dog's dinner. But just every time you go, if you're not happy with something, you can always take it off and, and do that bit again. But once you've got to the end of a fly, you can't go and fix the tail. So every time, do it. When you tie your first fly, keep it, set it aside. It may be good, it may be rubbish, but go back in three months, six months, tie the same fly, look at the two again, compare it to see where you've come. And every sort of six months, if you're good, you'll see the progression in it. So that would be my advice right. to people is tie a fly that you're going to fish with, keep it simple and uh, keep practicing. I think that's really good advice. Um, I know when I tried, when I first started getting into fly fishing, I, I decided I was going to be a fly tire as well. <laughs> Quickly just encouraged myself <laughs> that. Um, but I think part of the problem was though, Ryan, and I think it's, you know, when you get the fly tying kit and you get the book and it's got like a hundred flies to tie yeah. and it's got all these like different methods and you're trying to do everything and you're like, and you can't you're running before you can walk. Exactly. Yeah. It's overwhelming. I, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think it's a very good point. Like is that, and just pick one fly that you're going to fish with. So yeah. if you're, you know, trout angler, salmon angler, you know, just pick, so you'll have an actual interest in it and just, and I think that's the thing is, and then find out what are the, the methods yeah. needs just for that and just I think I'll go back now. <laughs> but, no, but again, like, like, now, like we, we didn't have the the tools that are available now. We've been talking about social media and, and YouTube. Yeah. We didn't have that. It is so, so much easier to get into fly time and to have advice. And if you don't like mine, you can go to someone else. You can go to you know the, especially Americans, you know, the, the some of them like very, very in detail uh some of those videos you know, on tying, tying a nymph could be 30 minutes long. Um, but but it depends what you like. But there's so much tuition available to you. The only difference I would say is now that the the, the sheer volume of materials that's available now is is overwhelming. You know, where do you start? Like there's there's millions of different things, as I said, whereas we when we started, we were tying with seal spurs, oval tensils, capes natural stuff that, that would have been shot. There was none of these synthetics, but uh, pick a fly, find a video, find somebody that you like as a tutor, as a tutor online and, and go with that. And then once you're happy with the techniques that you've, that you've learned, then you can add something a little bit to it. But start with something simple. Start with a hair's ear nymph. Start with a pheasant tail nymph, something you're going to use. Yeah. Everybody. Then a simple wet fly. Then a winged wet fly. Then lock flies with you know, telephone flies and stuff like that with a million hackles on them and bits and bites and stuff sticking out of them, you know, it all comes down to that. And then a fully dressed uh, 19th century salmon fly. Hmm. Yep, that's, you'll end up there. That's that's, <laughs> that's where you end up. Yeah. I, actually, speaking about salmon flies, it was something I wanted to bring up when I knew you were coming on. And we did last spring, we did a, a podcast on the 1902 Cork uh, fly uh, collection. And I wanted to, and me, when I got on to you and you said, just hold on. And um, we can't see it here now, but um, you're setting about and you're going to replicate and tie yeah. every fly in that collection, which I think yeah. is a brilliant undertaking. I've seen a couple of them. It's absolutely amazing what you're doing. How many flies are you going to have to tie for that? Uh, so I, I haven't counted it, but it's roughly I think it's 390 or something like that. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Right. So, but uh, I, it, it's it's an offshoot of a bigger project. <laughs> okay, you're right. So, so there, there's actually there's uh, all of the classic salmon flies. Uh, I'm, I've started to tie them alphabetically. <laughs> um, so, so I've been at that for a while. But as I said, like a, it's it's a fad thing. I, I'll go on a binge and I'll tie. When I tie them, I can tie six or seven in a night, um, because. I'm, I have a speed to it, uh, and I'm I'm tying them. I'm when I when you start off tying classic flies, you sort of get obsessed with these big frame jobs that you see, and in reality, those aren't a true representation of what they were. You know, they weren't tied at you know three inches long or four inches long, and and this size with the the bars of color all lined up as such. So in my progression through tying them, I sort of have tried to replicate maybe an older, more fishing style to them. Um, so I started off 
there was a couple of books come out, you know, with the list of supposedly all the known ones. Then another book would come out, you know, there's a book come out and it was like 1700 patterns. And I thought, well, that's a lot, but I'll have a go at it. And then another book comes out and another book. And then we've got three and a half thousand of them that are known now in the, uh, there's a classic fly compendium, which is them all listed uh, alphabetically. And, you know, there might be, there might be 10 variations of an Ackroyd say, you know, by different tires of the day or different uh, houses that were, that were making them commercially. So I started into that, but you know, it's A, B, C, D, I'm somewhere in the black at the minute, I think I am. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, right. uh, you know, when it, you said you had a lot of materials up in the room, you, you weren't lying, were you? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, wow. So roughly you're talking, you're going to be in the couple of thousand, are you? Different materials? Oh, are, are, are. No, 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 no. In actual numbers of... Uh, Classic flies. Well, I mean, uh, there's going to there's going to be about three and a half thousand of them. So I, I, I'm hoping that I don't have to pass the legacy on to to the to the to the middle boy. <laughs> so we'll see. I understand what you're saying about the framing because you know uh, you know they they weren't tied like that. They were fishing flies. Sensibly, initially they were fishing flies. They were tied to yeah, catch fish. They were. Yep. So, but will you frame them? How how are you going to are you going to put them in a box boxes or what? What? How are you going to store them? Basically. Uh, well, I actually got uh, permission at last to put them on the wall recently. So uh, I, I started, because uh, I, I had been sort of keeping them in Riker boxes and stuff like that, waiting for until I had enough of them, until uh, someone decided that to like flies enough to have them on the wall. So uh, <laughs> I then he goes, yeah, we'll concede to put some of them up there. So I produced three frames because I had 300 tied at that stage, which is only a month ago or so. So I put up those but then all of a sudden the cork collection uh came out and whenever i started going through it i realized that there were so many of them that alphabetically are already behind where i am so I, and also i thought as a standalone collection that it, it probably has more merit uh, as well you know so so i'm keeping them together and i'm tying them beside it so i started into them and I think of 36 or so of them tied at the minute. Uh, so that's 10% of the way. But I started about a month or two ago with them. So, but it's it looks well on the wall. Uh, it's just uh, I, I don't I don't think she's 100% uh, <laughs> realize how many frames. So I got I got those big frames out of IKEA to do them in because ultimately I'm going to have uh, there's about 100 flies a frame, and I'm talking about three and a half, four thousand flies. That's you know, it's it's 35, 40 frames that are three foot by two foot. So uh, oh, <laughs> a lot of wall have, space needed. Uh, well, there isn't enough wall space. So what <laughs> I'm going to have to do is I'm going to rotate them. So uh, I'll I'll put them up as I tie them, and then they'll sit for a while, and then they'll uh, the next frame will go up, and the first one will go back, and I'll just I can just take. Them. I don't ultimately I don't really know what's going to happen to them whenever. I disappear. Probably <laughs> someone will say, someone will say I'll I'll sell them and they'll get like fifty quid a frame or something like that for them if they're lucky. So well, I have to say the nineteen oh two collection. I'd love to see that one. That's completed. Like I think that that'd be a lovely thing. You know, you could see it together. Like you know, to be yep. just to see it. Like in the history behind it as well. So we'll keep us posted on that one. Can I ask yep. you, uh, Ryan, um, in terms of influence or mentors, was there anybody you looked up in terms of fly tying um, influence? I, as I said, I, I, I was I was taught to put the the basic, you know, I'd, uh, one night tuition when I'd have been what was I eight eight or nine or something like that. There was basically just this is how you put stuff on, and then from that it was it was just experiment wow. yourself. Yeah. So no, there, there wasn't there wasn't anything. And I'll, I'll, har I'll harken back again, Dara. There, I'll harken back to Ryan and myself in the same vintage. But like when we started fly time. The only thing I remember hearing about particular flight tires was Rogan's. Mm. You know, I'd heard of Rogan's, but I wouldn't have heard of many, you know, there was no big stars in the flight tire world. There might have been, like here, there would have been people I would have known locally that were good flight tires. Mm. But it's not like now. It's so, And I think it's social media that is probably oh, a lot of flight tires out, out there. Yeah. But can I, can I ask you then, does that mean that, like nowadays, when there's so much sharing of information, which is good on one hand, that it becomes quite homogenized, you know, because like if you're growing up, Ryan, 
you know, you're growing up your own style because you're not being influenced by what yeah. you've seen or read. And likewise, Tom, where you've grown up, you're not being influenced by outside. Folk. So you're kind of bringing more imagination and creativity and originality to the table. Yeah. Whereas now I wonder, like, yes, it's good you're sharing information, but maybe there's less of that happening. I don't know. I think it's just so wide of a field now that you can you can choose to go as niche as you possibly feel like. So there there are still people, you know, like I said, I, I still see something all the time and go, geez, never seen that before. And you can head down that route if you want. You know, you, you might have 10 followers and tell you something quite bizarre, but it's still, you know, they're still, they're still I, I don't think it'll all become the same, no. I think people still choose a line or a route to go down themselves, whereas some of us like to tie everything. But most people will most people will tie us a, a finer sort of a niche. I might have what I'm saying, like I I because I do we've fly time classes here and even with for the adults that do it, even though like we'll sit down, I'll tie a reference pattern first to what we're doing and mm. everybody will tie it. And even then they've all seen the way to be tied, and occasionally I show a video, a YouTube video of it being tied. All the patterns will be slightly different. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and even you know because everybody has their own style. And to this day, now I guys I fish with, and this is just trout flies. I'll look at it and I can nearly tell uh, if it's somebody I fish with a lot and I use their flies. Oh, that's that's like I know Mike Shanks' pattern. Yeah. You know, because mm. they have their own style of tying. Uh, Paul Giras that comes here, he has his own style of. I, I'd know the head on a Paul your yeah. ass fly straight away, you know? Yeah. And would, would you would you fish with someone else's fly? If it catches fish, I'll fish with it. Yeah. That's I, the way. I, I, are you, oh, you'll only fish with your own, will you? Uh, yeah. Large, <laughs> large, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's very, I would say in my life, very, very, very rare that I've ever tied on like I, I can appreciate someone else's, but it's, there's just something about it. It's that it's maybe the connection to it or something. But but no, I I, I find it very difficult uh, to do that. I, I'll generally fish something I've tied myself. I may keep it in the box and copy it, but then whenever I've tied it, I'm happy. You know, I, I don't know what it is. There's something there's something something there in my head with that one. You know, I I, I will almost only fish with something I've tied myself. What's your favorite fly to tie? Favorite fly to tie, probably a classic fly. I, I like tying a, a fly called the flood tide. It, you know, whenever I look at classic flies, I don't look at most of them. I don't see their connection to catching a fish with them. They they seem sterile. You know, it, it's hard to see. But I think they just had so many fish then. You know that it, it was maybe easier. I have fished with classic flies. I have caught salmon on classic flies, but I'd be very selective in the ones that I would choose to fish with and I'd choose ones that were had more motion in them you know maybe they have like a, a marabou or a spay type hackle or something like that there and the the rigid sort of ones I, I find it harder to relate to um so but a, a flood tide is definitely one of my favorite I like tying Wilkinson shrimps which you might have seen for you know a cla- uh, a modern shrimp fly I've never caught a fish on one ever <laughs> but I really I really like the color combination I really like tying them but I, the way I work with salmon is that you're used to, you catch fish, salmon lie in lies, you catch them in the same spot though, you know that you're covering a taking place. So, and in that you probably don't get that huge amount of time at them and you want to be able to catch one. So you'll fish something that you know will work. So if I have confidence in a fly, I'll fish it. Yeah. What I tend to do is I, I, I almost always fish two flies. And if I catch a fish, then I'll maybe put on a fly I haven't caught a fish on before on the dropper or something like that. And if I catch a fish in that, then I'll have confidence in it for a game. But I, I will leave flies that I'm confident in on all day and chop and change something that I'm not so confident in until it's because I've never caught a fish on, like I've never caught a fish on that. I've never caught a fish on a cascade, but then I refuse to fish cascades because <laughs> everyone fishes them. Um, so uh, Wilkinson is something that I have to catch a fish on. I'm intent on catching one. Purple flies was another thing that, you know, people fish a lot, but I'd never caught a fish on. So I just set myself the target a couple of years ago that I was going to catch a fish on purple flies and I fished and fished at them. And then I became confident in them because I was catching them. So, yeah. um, so those are, those are two certainly that I, that I do like to, to tie, but 
I hooked a fish on a flood tide, but otherwise I've never caught a fish on either of the two of them. So it's just I like them. They're uh, they're striking looking. Tell me this, Ryan. Uh, something I wanted to ask you, and uh, going back to the old flies. Yeah. Uh, I was looking at the dressings there on some of them, and I just want to ask you, like, you know, some of them like toucan and red ibis. Like a lot of the a lot of the feathers and materials that were used, like they're protected species now. Uh, some of them aren't. Some of them. Some of them aren't. Some of them aren't. Uh, yeah. so, so some of them are not necessarily protected, but just you can't go into areas where the FARC gorillas control in Colombia and just run around with an air rifle, you know, so <laughs> so they can't get them out. Or maybe they're they're not protected, but they may have bans on exporting them, etc. Right. So, yes, the price of them has gone ridiculous. Um, some of those things you're talking about, like those tiny little feathers are 10 and 15 pounds of feather. Uh, and you're putting them into a fly that requires two, three, four of them, you know, you can run into fairly hefty cost to actually tie a fly. So, wow. uh, so yeah, th- there's... Is there any material that is not available? Not available. Yeah, is there anyone that you couldn't get any more of, let's say, from the flies from the 19th century? Like you said... No, not, not, not particularly. There, there, there's one really weird material, which is is like the beard of a, of a clam or something like that. And I forget what it's even called, but there's one random obscure fly that uses this, like it's like sea beard or something it's called, which is like some, you know, the way a mussel sticks onto rocks with like yeah. these fairy things. There's some sort of a thing like that from a, from some weird mollusk that I think is probably the rarest of them. Or, or gold beater skin, I think, is another one that's a little bit rare. But uh, in general, most of the things can be got. It's just they're using old taxidermy uh Mounts or something right. like that, you know, searching for those or old collections that come up for sale. You're, you can take a fly apart and use maybe reuse the materials out of it. But um, collecting materials is as much a uh, drug. It's a whole other rabbit as, hole. <laughs> as, as, yeah, as, as anything like so. Uh, yeah. Uh, and there are, listen, there, there are, you can use substitutes. I make substitutes for Indian Crow myself. I develop techniques for making them and you can use different things for your chatterers etc uh, and the cory bustard you know you, you probably heard the you know bustards are well protected anyway uh, mm. but some of the i think the san diego zoo started a program whereby they would collect all the feathers that fell out of the ones they were breeding and they gave them to uh the classic fly community over there and they distributed them because if you reduce if you remove the price of them then there's no Demand. pressure on someone to go and shoot the things yeah. so so they, they did that which i thought was very good and it'd, it'd be good if zoos would get into uh that over here as well you know or that they they could maybe ask for a donation or something like that there but ultimately if the feathers were given away uh for free it would reduce the pressure on the on the wild. Yeah, great idea. Um, Ryan, final question. It's mm. been uh, fascinating chatting to you um, and, you know, really hearing about, I suppose, the kind of initial parallel between your fly fishing career and the fly tying and now it's it's come around to fly tying. The fly tying, yeah. <laughs> Mainly like... Um, maybe when I retire. When I retire. Yeah, I when the kids have left. <laughs> but tell me this, um, most memorable fish caught in the fly. What is it? Oh, I had to think about that, and there was a few who came to mind. Like there's, there's a salmon I caught in the River Tempo, which is a tribute to the urn, and uh, I caught it by mistake. But there hadn't been one seen, essentially, since the dam went up. Uh, Polly Shannon, it was just random. I uh, caught it on a, on a trout streamer, and then the first one that my son landed, I hooked and handed to him. But the one that is probably most memorable is. Uh, my dad got me into fishing uh, when I was young, but he died when I was young as well. And I was left with his rods. And I know that he hooked a couple of salmon fishing uh, Loch Melvin and I think one on Loch Con and lost both of them. I remember back then, whenever they were fishing with Loch rods, they were 11, it's, I think it's 11 foot three for like a seven weight, but it literally you can bend it right round till, <laughs> till the, the butt touches the tip. And uh, so I got that refurbished. Uh, there's a guy here in uh, in the town I live in, McGuire's Bridge, Packy Trotter, and uh, I brought it to him. He stripped it down, I revarnished it, put the eyes and all on, tidied up the cork, and I got 
my son tied uh, me a fly and I went up on the derg and I, I caught a salmon on his rod. And that one stands out for me. I actually made a, I made a YouTube video of it at the time, sort of to remind me of it. But it was really, it was really an emotional fish for me. Uh, and it, it just, I understand why he lost his salmon after it because, like, <laughs> it's not built for for playing fish at all. You know, and my wrist was wrecked by the time I got it. And it wasn't a big fish. It wasn't a clean fish, but it was caught on his rod and a uh, fly my son tied. So it was that's that's it. Oh, beautiful. Um, and the importance of generations when it comes to fly fishing as well, isn't it? Like handed down to yep. the generations as well. Um, Ryan, before we let you go, what's the YouTube um, channel, the handle for if people want to check out your fly tying videos? That's just my name. If you look for my name and fly tying, it'll, it'll, it should come up. Brilliant. And there's there's lots of great videos there for people to uh, to watch and learn from. Uh, I'm not sure how many is there at the moment. There might be five or 600 on it at this stage. So it uh, it's it sort of just grow ticks itself over at, at some point i'm hoping it sort of hits a critical mass and uh, and produces you know like a hundred thousand followers and i can quit work but uh, <laughs> at, the, at the minute at the minute no it, it, it it's it's just taken over so i think we're at about six and a half so no seven and a half thousand well listen we'll, we'll definitely recommend it um, as a channel and as a resource and um, for people that want to, to learn some more from it ryan houston thanks very much for joining us thank you very much Our thanks to Ryan Houston for joining us on the show. And don't forget to rate, review and follow the Ireland on the Fly podcast on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Plus, you can keep up to date on IrelandOnTheFly.com as well as on Instagram. And myself and Tom will be back with another episode about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland.